Merci beaucoup. Thank you all very much. It is such an honor to have the opportunity of being invited to speak on this occasion. We have already heard some wonderful speeches, and you are about to hear a great many more good speeches. So I am going to be brief in introducing this third session, which is focused on the future. And I'm going to follow the theme of this entire session by saying, first of all, that there are three questions that we must answer when we confront the climate crisis. I would remind you uh, in using the word crisis that many have noted that in some languages the word crisis is used with two, is expressed in two symbols, the first meaning danger and the second meaning opportunity. These are two sides of the same concept and naturally we focus on the danger because our evolutionary ancestors have bequeathed those traits to us, but we must also uh, discipline ourselves to look over the horizon at the opportunity that is inherent in any crisis, and that is what I want to focus on today. But first, the number one question is, must we change? We have had 150 years of development based on the burning of carbon-based fuels, coal and oil, and now gas, and they have contributed tremendously to many advances in global civilization, the reduction of poverty, the improvement in the standards of living for many, though we must also focus as we confront the climate, climate crisis on continuing to reduce extreme poverty. We should have a goal of zero poverty as well as zero carbon emissions. But the answer to the first question, must we change, in spite of all the progress that has accompanied the burning of fossil fuels, is an answer that has long since come from the scientific community, nearly unanimous in telling us that the accumulation of man-made greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is causing a massive disruption of the climate balance, a disruption of the water cycle, a threat to food security, as the FAO can document uh, in detail for us, and they have told us here at this meeting. And the scientists are very clear. Every National Academy of Science of every nation on the planet is in agreement. Every professional scientific association is in agreement. But leave aside the science for a moment and listen to the answer to that first question, must we change, that is being given to us by nature itself. The climate-related extreme weather events are becoming more frequent and much more intense. Just during the week that we have been here in Paris, look at what has happened in Chennai, in the state of Tamil Nadu, uh, in India. 150 millimeters of rain. And yes, the pattern of urbanization there has complicated the flooding consequences of that downpour. But the simple truth is that the accumulation of man-made global warming pollution in the atmosphere now traps as much extra heat energy in the Earth's atmosphere as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every day on planet Earth. It's a big planet, but that's an enormous amount of energy. More than 90% of it goes into the oceans and causes a massive increase in the water vapor coming from the oceans into the atmosphere, and the warmer air holds more. So when the conditions release downpours, the downpours are much larger and more intense, causing the kinds of consequences we see on the television news right now in Chennai. We are, we are also seeing uh, this same extra heat pull soil moisture out of the soils, uh, causing deep and long-lasting droughts like the one in California in my home country and in many other regions, parts of southern Africa right now, the Korean Peninsula and in other places like uh, Sao Paulo State. We are seeing the melting of the ice and the rising of sea, sea, the seas, threatening the lives and livelihoods of our brothers and sisters in the vulnerable states, including the island nations, deltas uh, in countries like Bangladesh, islands in the Bay of Bengal, uh, and cities around the world. I was in Miami in my country uh, just two months ago, and during the time of the highest of the high tides, there were fish 
swimming from the ocean, swimming in the streets of some of the cities in South Florida. So the answer to that first question, must we change, is clearly, yes, we must change. The second question after must we change is, can we change? Five years ago, the answer to that question was not as crystal clear as it is now. But today, because of the work of business leaders and technology developers and researchers and investors, we have seen an explosion uh, in the installation of cost-effective renewable energy, solar pho photovoltaic energy, wind power. Now battery storage is coming down rapidly in cost as well. The introduction of new efficiency improvements in every part of the global economy. These changes are providing the answer to that second question. Yes, we can change. In my own country, in this calendar year of 2015, more than 70% of all the new electricity generation capacity has come from solar and wind. Worldwide, more than half now comes from solar and wind. The investor community has been shifting resources over the last several years to the point that the amount invested in renewables now far exceeds the amount in new fossil fuel generating capacity, and the difference grows year by year. We are seeing the emergence of this powerful answer to the question, can we change? And the answer is yes, we can change. So the third and final question, one that is uh, addressed to all of us here at this Paris conference, is will we change? I believe the answer to that question is yes as well. We heard the answer in the addresses by 150 heads of state last Monday, the largest gathering of heads of state on one day in one place in the history of the world. We have heard the answer from the heads of regional governments like California, like Quebec, like South Australia. I could go and mention many others and, and also municipal governments that are providing fantastic leadership. We are seeing the emergence of a powerful determination to answer the question, yes, uh, we, we, we will change. This uh, question of whether we have the political will to do what we know is right is not a question that has been asked for the very first time in the context of the climate crisis. In the history of humanity, there have been many great moral causes that have asked us to choose between what is right and what is wrong. The abolition of slavery, the right of women to vote, civil rights, the abolition of apartheid, and the list goes on. Uh, gender uh, equity, sexual preference equity. We have seen that every time the question is ultimately resolved into a binary choice between right and wrong, the outcome is foreordained because of who we are as human beings, 99% of us. Right is, the, the, the right choice is to safeguard the future for the next generation and for the generations to come. And young people are looking to us to provide the correct answer to that question. All around the world, you have seen the young people in marches demanding that we do the right thing. Of course, there are disagreements on the wording of this section or that section, but ultimately, at the end of this conference, we must come together and provide the answer to that third and final question, yes, we will change. For those who doubt that we have the political will to change, I ask you to always remember that political will is itself a renewable resource. Thank you and merci beaucoup.